Hi, YouTube, and welcome to this free 3D animation course in Autodesk Maya, where we're gonna cover how to create this line graph. Now, this course is a excerpt of a larger course at digitalcreatorschool.com, where you can also learn to animate 3D pie charts, uh, bar graphs, and 3D maps. So in this one, we're just gonna cover the line graph. Uh, the, these techniques can be applied to any kind of ideas you can come up with. I just used data visualization as a nice kind of creative brief so that we have something to target for. And uh, this course is for someone who's never even opened Maya. So don't be concerned if you know this is an intermediate or advanced thing. It's not. We're going to start from scratch. So feel free to follow along with a downloadable free trial of Maya, which you can get linked in the description. Um, and that's good for 30 days. Now, also, don't forget to hit the resolution button down here, the gear wheel, so that you can crank up the resolution so that you can actually see the text of the menus and stuff on screen while you're watching. But yeah, uh, if you enjoyed this, let me know. Like, comment, subscribe. Um, and maybe I can do more kind of large excerpts of my other courses at digitalcreatorschool.com, which if you do want to become a member, you can sign up currently for a monthly or annual membership and you can cancel any time so you can get access to the rest of this course there. But let's get started. Welcome to the first video of the class. I just want to take an opportunity to say, don't be intimidated. There's a lot going on in this screen. We have all these buttons up here. We have all these different menus. We are only going to focus on about five or 10% of that. So I will walk you through step-by-step step exactly what you need to use. And you also have the discussion or message me if you have any questions. I know 3D can be very intimidating. It was when I first started learning it and I'm, I'm still learning it, to be honest. I'll never stop learning it. It's one of those things. You will always be a student of this. So don't be intimidated. This course is designed for the beginner to follow step-by-step step and get the same results. Really quick, I wanted to take a moment to mention you can download Maya for free and have a trial for one month. And if you are a student at a university or somewhere you can prove that you're a student, I would highly, highly recommend that you go for the free software for three years. There will be a little window that pops up that says it's a student version, but other than that, you have a fully functional Maya. So if you're a student at a school, definitely do this. Okay, back to the video. So let's dive in and kind of look at what we're dealing with here in this software. Ignore all of these buttons at the top, okay? We just want to learn how to navigate around this welcome sign. Your Maya should look something like this, this type of a view with a grid down here. Your grid might be a different size and you probably don't have this welcome sign. I just made that. We can just select that and delete it. One of the first things we can do is turn on anti-aliasing. You might be able to see that my, that my view here is a little pixelated. If we create a new shape here, I'm gonna hit F to focus in. The edges are a little rough. We can kind of maybe see that. I don't know if it shows up on your screen, but there's an anti-aliasing button up here. And if you click that, it'll just smooth everything out. And hopefully you'll be able to see that on your screen, even though it's probably difficult to see that difference on mine. That's just one nice little thing to turn on for your eyes. Next, let's take a look at how to navigate. You will need a three button mouse for this. So if you're working on a laptop and you don't have a mouse plugged in, pause the video and go plug in a three button mouse. Okay, for the three button mouse to scroll around, if we just start clicking, we, we're only selecting things. For us to be able to navigate with our mouse, we need to hold down Alt. And then once we start clicking, now we can rotate. If we hold the middle mouse, we can pan left and right. And right click, we zoom in and out. And those are the three buttons. That's it. So now we know how to move around. One thing to note is the center point that we're pivoting around when we view. If I'm over here and I want to see pivot around the sphere, I'm pivoting around the center of my view. As I did earlier, I can select the object and hit F. If that isn't working, you can go to view and say, look at selection. And that'll do a similar thing and reset the center pivot to be far enough away from the camera that it's easy to rotate around. The menu on the left is the outliner. It shows what is in our scene. Currently, we only have the sphere. If you can't see this, go to Windows Outliner. If your right side doesn't look like this, you can go to the top and hit this 
little box and that will be our channel box. And you can see there's also tabs along the side here that describe what each one of these are as we go through them. And the channel box is where we'll do most of the work. We can click and middle mouse drag in the viewport to isolate different directions and change their values and see what we have selected here, like the sphere. All right, thanks for watching the first video and let's jump into making a line graph. Okay, let's start a new session to make sure we're all starting from the same page. Okay, let's begin by making a line chart. I created this chart from the average high temperature in San Francisco. You may have some other type of data, but this is what I chose just as something random to use to have data. And we can begin by making these little spheres. So we'll go up here to the top left under poly modeling and we'll click this little sphere. It may ask you to click and drag and that means your interactive creation is checked on. If you wanted to just make a sphere at the center of the world, the zero zero grid down here, you can just turn this off and it'll make a sphere for you there. And if you want to delete the one you did, you can just select it from the outliner and hit delete and then click that again. We'll hit F to focus up and we have the sphere. And so what do we do with it? We want to make 12 of these because we're going to have 12 months of the year. And instead of duplicating this, which we could do by command D, hitting W, and then we have the opportunity to move it. We could drag these out and keep doing that and do that 12 times, but it's kind of hard to know the distance between each one and how, how far apart they are. So an easier way to do that is to use a duplicate special option up here under edit. We can go to duplicate special and hit this little square in the menu. It'll give us options. So we get a new window. And in the new window, we want to make sure it's a copy and parent. You can also go edit reset settings to make sure it's the default settings. And we want to duplicate these out in the X coordinate. And how do we know what the X coordinate is? If you look down here on the lower left, you can see that we have coordinates and also you can hit alt B to change the background color. It might be hard to see the Z on the blue. So you can hit Alt B and change your background color. So as we rotate, we can see it's changing axes and we can see that the X is to the right. That's right and left really. Positive is to the right and negative is to the left. As we drag it, we can look up in the top right and see it's changing a value here. We can type in a value if we want and it'll go a determined amount. So. We know we want to go X and we have this big matrix of zeros here. Once for translate rotate scale and they're listed here in order X, Y, Z. So we know translate X, Y, Z rotate X, Y, Z. So we want the X so we can do the first one under translate and let's say 20 for good measure right now. And we want to make 12 copies so we can say 12. Actually, we already have one, so we can just say 11. And then we can hit apply. Now, when we zoom out, we can see we have 12 spheres. And in the outliner, we can see we have those 12 spheres right here. Just to keep things orderly in the outliner, and again, if you don't have the outliner, you can go to Windows Outliner. We can hit Command or Control G and group them all. And we can name those spheres. We can close this window and now all we have to do is type in the amount that each month is. So the first month is January 57. So we have the first one selected and I'm going to go back to a blue background because we have gray spheres and I'm going to type in 57 for translate Y because Y is up. And then it shot off the screen. So where did it go? We can zoom out and see it. We can also hit F to zoom in on that and then zoom out to get a context of where it is in space. And then we can just go down the row and do that for each one. 
and I'm going to speed this part of the video up. Okay, now that we have the spheres done, they're a little hard to see because maybe they're a little small. Let, we can select all of them by clicking and dragging the viewport. And then we can go over here and just make sure we uniformly scale in every direction. We can click and drag all of these in the middle mouse. You can also type in a value, let's say two. Now to see these kind of more in a graphical way that we would in a graph, we can go to an orthographic view, meaning there's no distortion from a camera, just kind of like a flat view. So we want to see it from the front. If we hold down spacebar, we get the hotbox menu, which is just a condensed version of everything up here on the top. And it's a quick way to get to all the menu options. But when we press space and hold it, and then click in the middle here on Maya, we have all the options of all the cameras and we can quickly go between them. So let's choose front view and we'll release the mouse. So now that we're in the front view, we can't see our spheres. So let's select the group and then hit F to focus in on it. If we compare this to the graph that we looked at from Google Spreadsheets, we can see it doesn't really look the same way. The distribution isn't the same vertically because this graph starts at 55 and over here we're starting at zero. So they're all kind of bunched up vertically. We could go through and adjust those one by one. But one nice thing is we could select all of them by clicking and dragging. And then we can go to the translate Y because they're all, translate Y is all up and down here, right? So we can go to translate Y and we can actually type in an expression to change each one based off of the current value in each of their translate Y's. So let's hit asterisk. So that's like shift eight to get the asterisk and then equals. And then we can just say times 10. And so that's gonna shoot all of these really high. So let's hit enter and then they're way off the screen. So let's frame up and we can see that distribution is much closer to what we have in the spreadsheet. It's a lot clearer what's going on here. So the only issue is now we're really high up off of what is considered the ground in Maya. To get everything back down to the ground, we can just select all of these and drag them down. And I'm, of course, hitting W to get the move tool to pull up. That's the only tool we're needing lately um, besides the scale tool. The other tool we have at our disposal is the rotate tool, but on a sphere, that's not super useful because it just rotates around its center. So anyway, now we have the data points stretched out so we can kind of see the difference between each one. And we have them pulled back down to ground level. That's a great start. And in the next lesson, we will draw a 3D line for this next section, we're going to draw the line part of this line graph between each of these data points. So to begin, let's go to curves and surfaces, and we can pick this curve tool, the EP curve tool. When we click on it, we want to adjust the tool settings. And also for any tool, you can see the instructions for it down here in the bottom left while your cursor is in the viewport. We can see it says EP curve tool, click in a window to add edit points, enter to complete the curve. So to edit the actual attributes of using the tool, we can go to the little hammer here, uh, the middle button, and it'll pull up possibly in a new window, the tool settings. And we want to choose linear because we want straight lines between each of our data points. So we can close that now and we can start selecting in the center of each of our points. So let's choose our first point. Let's find kind of the center of the sphere and we'll click. Nothing really happened that we can see, but we're still in using the tool. We can see over here, it's still selected. This is that icon that we chose up here. 
that means uh, this is the tool you have selected. It also made a curve. So we can middle mouse drag and move around and we still have the tool in usable mode. We're still using it. So let's go to the second one. And as soon as we click here, we'll be able to see a line. Let's find the center. Now we can see the curve is starting to go between each of the points that we're selecting. So let's do that for each one. Okay, now that we're done, we can hit enter and we have finished creating the curve. If you messed up, you can just go over here and delete the curve and press this button again and start over and, and try to get it. So now that we have this curve, it's kind of starting to look like a line chart a little bit. This line isn't renderable though. And what that means is when and if we light this and start to use all the physics of light and uh, all the fancy stuff to make images of this, these curves aren't visible. So we need to put something down that's visible and it's polygons like the ones that we made for spheres, except we want a tube. So let's go back to poly modeling and click on the tube. And down here it has it selected the cylinder and we can see if we hit four, we can actually change to wire mode so we can see through things. If we hit five, we can go back to shaded mode. Six and seven are also other modes like texture and lights, but we don't have those yet. So we can only work, or it's only useful to work in four and five for us right now. So now that we have the cylinder, let's go back into wireframe mode. And if we hold down C and middle mouse drag, it will jump to the curve. And it didn't jump exactly to the curve. And let me explain what just happened. Because this top one is yellow, that means it's isolated, uh, this top arrow. And that is the Y corner. Again, if we look over here to the bottom left, we can see up and down is Y. And sometimes when you have been manipulating things on a certain axis, it'll try to remember that so that if we hold middle mouse and we drag, it'll maintain that isolation in how we're translating it. That's not as helpful when we're trying to do other things like this uh, snap to a curve little shortcut. So to get it to get out of this mode, all you have to do is just click the center. And we can see that now the vertical one is no longer yellow unless we hover over it like the other ones. So now let's go back and hit hold down C again and then middle mouse drag. And now we can see that it snapped to that curve and we can drag this along the curve uh, any way that we want. So we just want that to start there. Let's rotate it so that it is in line with the direction of the curve. We can kind of see that by lining up the wire frame of the cylinder with the straight edge of the curve. And sometimes it's hard to get small movements with this rotate manipulator. And what I like to do is hit the plus button and it makes the manipulator larger so we can move it over a smaller area and line it up exactly as we want it. Great. So we can go back to shaded mode if we want or stay in wireframe. What we can do now is extrude this cylinder over the entirety of the curve. And what that means is take faces of this and project it all along down that curve. To do that, let's go back to the perspective mode. So we'll hold down spacebar, click and hold and drag to the perspective view. Now we're back in perspective. We're still in wireframe. We can hit five again to get out of that. The other way we can get out of the front view, if we're still in that, is if you're having a hard time holding spacebar and holding the mouse and dragging and letting go, all that kind of thing, you can go to panels and perspective and just choose the perspective camera. Great, so now we're back in perspective. We can kind of see what we're starting to build. We have the cylinder aimed in the right direction. We want it to go down the length of that line and we will need to select the faces we want to extrude along it. We don't want to extrude the whole thing, right? That would kind of uh, look weird. We just want to extrude the faces that are facing the direction of the line. So let's hide this sphere so we can get a good look at the cylinder. We can select the sphere. We can go over here to visibility and hit zero, which means off. We can also select it by toggling down the group for spheres. And we can see that P sphere one is gray. It's not, it doesn't look like the others. So we know that one's invisible. 
and we can see over here it is turned off. We can turn that back on over here. So let's leave that off so we can see the cylinder. Let's go back to shaded mode by hitting five and let's click the cylinder and select the faces of the cylinder. Currently we're in object mode. We have the entire object and we can select it and move it around. But polygons are made of edges and vertices and faces. And right now we wanna select the faces. While the cursor is over the object, we can right click, hold, and we have this new menu. And it gives us the option to begin to edit the different aspects of this polygon. If we go to vertice, we can see all the little vertice dots. If we go to edge, now we can select the edges. But again, we want the faces for right now. So let's navigate over here and let's click and drag and select the faces. Great. The only bad thing is we clicked and dragged and it selected some things we don't want. To deselect those things, hit control on your keyboard and hold it. And now we can see next to our cursor is a minus symbol. That means we're gonna deselect those things. Okay, perfect. Now we can see, especially if we go into wire mode, we can see the only things we have selected are the top faces. Great. So now we can select the curve and go to the extrude tool. There's a couple ways to go to that. We can see this icon up here, and if we leave our mouse over it, it'll tell us this is the extrude, and extrude this selected component. But because we have selected the curve as well, we can see that's selected over here, in addition to these faces, it is gonna extrude these faces down that curve. So let's hit that. Great. That doesn't look like what we want. That's just uh, goes to the end of the line, not doesn't go over the whole thing. So how do we fix that? When we hit extrude, we got this extra little menu here and we can add divisions to it. And divisions are edges that go down a polygon. And as we increase divisions, we can see it pops and it has more points to put along the curve. So let's just drag this up really high. And we can see it starts to get more edges that it's able to describe that curve a lot more accurately. And when we get to these kind of corners, we can see it's not doing what we want it to do. So we can just continue to increase this, these divisions. Clicking and dragging, it maxes out at 25, but we can select the box here and just type in a number that we want. Again, that doesn't look exactly like what we want. So let's hit 60, maybe 100. We can just keep adding them until, whoops, until that's getting pretty close to what we want. 120 looks pretty good. Let's inspect everything. It's looking pretty good. Now we're still in component mode. Component meaning a vertice, an edge, or a face, because we can see we can still select faces and we can't go and select the entire object. To do that, we can right click and go to object mode. Alternatively, we can click this little button up here. That'll get us back into object mode. So we also have uh, the poly extrude over here as an input, and it gives us the same type of options that this window gives us, the number of divisions, all that kind of thing. So we can continue to adjust that as much as we want later, even though that window is no longer up. We still have the options. It's just a little hidden down here under the inputs. Okay, great. Let's unhide the sphere by hitting shift H, or we could go over here and turn on the visibility by pressing one. And now we have the data points with a line through them. In this lesson, we will now rig this graph for animation. If you are not interested in animation or animating this graph and you just want a still frame, then you can skip this lesson and the animation lesson and just go on to the next ones. Uh, but here we will, if we want to animate this thing, we need to give ourselves ways to control it. So to do that, that's called rigging. So let's begin. Let's click our curve over here in the outliner. If you don't have your outline, if you don't have your outliner open, again, that's Windows Outliner. And with our curve selected, we're going to introduce a new little trick called the isolate select button up here. Um, it's a cursor with a dotted square, a dash square. And when we click that, it will isolate whatever selection we have. And because the curve was on the inside of that tube, it's easier to select it from the outliner. 
Similarly to the tube, we can also select components of a curve. If we, and in the same way, if we right click and hold, we'll also get options similarly to the faces that we selected on the tube. We have different types of controls for a curve. So what we want is control vertex. We're gonna right click and let go over here over control vertex. And now we can see we've gotten the points back that we originally created um, when we first drew the curve between the points. So the reason why we're rigging it though, and instead of just animating these points individually, is that we would have to animate multiple things. We'd have to animate this point and then we'd have to go animate the sphere and all that kind of a thing. So we wanna rig it in a way that we just have to animate one thing and I'm choosing the sphere. So later when we animate it, we'll select the sphere and just animate that. And we want this curve and the tube to follow along. And because we created the tube, um, extruded along the curve, the tube is already gonna follow this curve. So we want to constrain these points to the spheres. To start doing that, we need to select the first one and go to the animation menu. You can get to it from this drop down over here, select animation, and then you have the option uh, menu for deform. We'll click that and there's a lot of options, but we are only interested in the cluster option. Click cluster and then we get this little C down here and we get a new item in the outliner called the cluster handle. And with that selected, we can now move the curve as well. So it looks similar to what we already had with control vertice, but what this allows us to do is create a parent-child relationship. And if we click the cluster handle, we middle mouse click it in the outliner and we drag it to the top where we know the P sphere, which is the cluster this is over. If we drop it in here, let me go back and I'm clicking isolate select again to get back to see everything. Now that we have middle mouse drag this over the sphere, once we click the sphere, this cluster is a child of it, so it will follow it. So it's following it around as well as the tube that follows the curve. So it creates this relationships that'll make it easier to animate each one of these balls. But we can see that there's a little problem down here. Um, not everything is going with the curve. And that's because when we extruded the cylinder over the curve, we just selected the top faces. So to fix that, we can just create another cluster for this little section of the tube that we did not extrude over the curve. So let's isolate the tube here by clicking the isolate select. Let's go back to the faces by right clicking and dragging down to face to select face. And let's click and drag and just select all of these bottom faces that aren't following the curve yet. And then we'll go back to the deform menu and, and create another cluster. Now we have another C and we have a cluster two handle down here. Again, we'll just repeat the same thing we did, middle mouse drag it over P sphere. Now when we uh, undo isolate and we have the sphere selected and move it, the whole thing moves with it. There's still a little weirdness going on. It looks like one edge isn't following. So let's look at that. I believe it's this edge. So if we right click and now we can choose edges, let's just delete that edge. We can delete the edge by holding down shift and then right clicking. And we get this menu that says delete edge over here. Okay, now we have the sphere and now we have that it no longer looks a little wonky there at that intersection. Okay, cool. So let's undo to get that back in the right position. And let's just repeat what we did for each one of these spheres. We'll do this next one together and then I'll speed the rest up. So let's isolate select the curve again. Go up here, isolate select, right click, control vertex. Then we'll select this control vertex, deform, cluster, then we'll middle mouse drag the cluster to the P sphere two. Let's unisolate that, select the sphere, and now we have control over that sphere. Cool. All right, I'll leave it up to you to do the rest of these points. Uh, I'm just gonna repeat exactly what I just did for each one of these points, and I will see you in the next lesson. 
Hey, I just wanted to take a moment to say thanks for making it this far in the course. And if you like it, please don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe so I know that people want to see more of this kind of a thing. And if you get through the whole course and you want to see more of it and the rest of it, then you can become a member at digitalcreatorschool.com. But uh, let's jump back into it. Thanks for watching. In this lesson, we will begin animating. And it will be a lot easier now that we have the line graph rigged for animation. The C's that we see for all the clusters are a little distracting. So there's two ways that we could hide those just for ourselves right now. We could go to show and go down to deformers. I think it's in the middle here, deformers. Click that and we can hide the deformers that way. The other way we could do that is a little more technical, but what the heck. Uh, we'll go up here to this little box. If you don't have that, there's these little vertical lines that turn into arrows so you can collapse these portions of the menu up here. So you might not see in all of this mess up here the option to write in anything. So it'll be kind of the second from the last on the right. And if it doesn't look like this, it might say X, Y, Z because it's probably, I think the default is this. But if we click this icon and hold it, we can select by name. And this is just going to be an easier way to select all the clusters because your outliner should look like mine now. There's clusters under each one of these. And to select each one is kind of uh, monotonous a little bit and it takes too much time. So let's go to the select by name up here and we'll just type cluster because we know that's how each one of those are named. The first thing in the name is cluster. I don't want to type in, uh, you know, one through 12 or whatever we have. So I can just hit an asterisk up here. Let me move my cursor so you can see it. So it says cluster asterisk and I'll hit enter. And so the asterisk means anything can be there after the, after whatever I have before the asterisk. So it's like cluster and then it could be whatever and it'll select it. And for us, that means it can be cluster one, two, three, four, five, whatever it is. It doesn't matter as long as it says cluster. And then we put that asterisk to signal, you know, I don't care what comes after cluster, just select everything that says cluster. And then whatever after that, I don't care is what the asterisk means. So we have all the clusters selected and that's a quick way to do that. And in Maya, there's also, you know, of course, there's everything under the sun in here. And again, just ignore this if you don't really, um, you know, this doesn't feel like that's important to you. This isn't crucial to the course at all. It's just trying to teach you a little bit more Maya as we go along. Um, there are these display layers over here. So there's nothing in there right now. And there's this little tab that says display. There's these four icons. And we can go over here and we can say create new, a new layer and assign selected objects. That tooltip might be off the screen a little bit, but if you hover over it and just uh, leave your mouse there, that's what it'll say. So because we have those clusters selected, if we pick this icon over here, it'll automatically add everything we have selected to this layer. And just to keep everything clean, we can call that clusters. And now we have one button to turn on and off the visibility of all those items. So if the clusters, the C is getting annoying, just click that. Okay, so let's get to animating. Because we did all the rigging, we can take each one of these spheres and just animate the spheres. So before we start animating the spheres, we want to save the position that they're all in because that's where we want them to end up. Let's go down here to the timeline, which is this little area that we can scrub this cursor back and forth if you click and hold it. And we're working in 24 frames a second by default, which you can get to, you can see over here, there's a little drop down menu. Um, and if you're in an earlier version of Maya, you might have to go to the settings over here, which is this man with the gear and it's up here and we can pick our frame rate up here. But let's, let's stick with 24 frames a second. That's what most movies are, are made in. And, um, we can scroll up to, well, let's just pick like 60 for right now. We can select the sphere, go over to translate Y and we can right click and say key selected. We can see this little red mark up here by the translate Y value is displayed. And we can do that for each one. We can shift select each one, and then we can say right click key selected. We could hit S and it'll key everything. 
And that's a shortcut for that. But just to be efficient with the keys, and so we signal to ourselves that we only want to key the Y translate. We don't want to take one of these balls and go over here or whatever. You know, this is a graph. We just want to stay in its Y axis. So we just want to key the translate Y. So now that we have this little red mark on the 60 mark time mark in the timeline, we can drag this back earlier, let's say 30, and we can select all the spheres. Let's do it from the outliner this time. And let's just hit zero. And actually, before we do that, let's take a look down here and make sure that our auto keyframe is on. If that was off and we change this value, we it kind of gets what we want. But then when we scrub the timeline, it disappears again. So to save any time that we move an attribute that is keyed already, um, that will auto key it. So let's go to 30 and we'll go to zero for all of those. Great. So now they're all starting out at the bottom. Now, the only thing that looks odd to me about this is the fact that this tube, if we scrub now, at some point it turns black. Uh, so let's troubleshoot that. A lot of 3D, you know, nothing works perfect the first time or maybe ever. Um, but you kind of, you know, go along and do what you can and then uh, fix things as they pop up. So like the cluster before, I'm suspecting that probably has something to do with that on the first sphere. So let's go down to where we're at frame 30, where we know all of these spheres are keyed on. We can see this red little line down here. So let's scroll over here because I get, I'm guessing it probably has to do with this first one. So let's take this sphere and drag it up. Yep. What's happening is the tube is flipping. Uh, it's turning inside out, essentially. It doesn't know which way to go as everything gets even with each other. So we'll just have to um, kind of cheat that a little bit and have this first sphere be like a little above each, uh, all of the other ones. And when this is animating, it'll happen so quick. Uh, you know, you won't, you won't be able to tell that little bit of a difference, but this little kink in the tube is a little more noticeable. So let's go to our handle that we, our cluster that we, the second one we made for this sphere. And actually let's turn on the cluster so we can see it and that we have it selected and we can hit E to get rotation. And if we select the axis that we want to rotate on, it'll isolate it. And then we kind of get this little pie chart looking thing that it will uh, isolate and we can see how far we're rotating it. Conversely, we could rotate it from the channel box over here by middle mouse dragging in the viewport once we have that attribute selected. So I think if we key this, Let's go to 60 because we know this is where it wants to end up in this position. So we can key rotations only by hitting shift E and that'll key all rotations. Or if we just want to be very particular and only key the rotate Z, which is the axis we will be animating it on to fix this problem, we can just right click in the channel box and choose key selected. So let's go back to frame 30 where we chose to begin the animation and we can rotate this down. Okay, great. So we fixed that little issue. We can hide the clusters again and look at our animation. To play animation, you can hit the play button over here in the far right, or you can hit Alt V on your keyboard. So that looks, you know, it's something, it's moving. It's not super interesting. So let's make this look a little more appealing. So let's do that in the next lesson. In this lesson, let's make this look a little more appealing. We can start by adding a little bounce to the end of their position. So when they go up to it, it'll kind of go past and then kind of settle, kind of bounce, spring back into the little resting position here. So the idea is if this is the end position up here and this is the start position down here, we are going to go up and we'll go past that position. So this will be a new keyframe up here. And then we're gonna go down past the end position again, but not as far as this distance, right? We wanna go shorter. So we wanna go maybe, you know, up here. 
And these lines aren't indicative of going this direction. This is just me making room for uh, having room to, to go up and down. And then we'll go again back, but not as far as either of these distances, and then maybe back down and end on that position. So we can choose all of these and do it with all of them. Because the first and last one are kind of ending and starting in the same position, we'll just ignore them. So we can shift select all of the middle spheres and from the outliner, and let's go to where everything ends. And let's go out maybe five frames, and we will translate, create a new keyframe on translate Y, right clicking and say key selected. We'll go another five frames and do the same thing. We'll go another five frames, do the same thing. And I think that's enough. So basically, basically we're making a new end position. So the end is really going to be 75 now. So this first one, we're going to drag everything past where it should be. And now when we go to 65, it's going to snap back to the original position. So we know where kind of the ground zero is for where we're bouncing in between, because we know we want to go past that again down. And then when we go to 70, it snaps back again, and then we just slightly go up just a little bit. So when we play that, Alt-V kind of springs. So it goes up, down, back, up, down, back. A way to visualize that is in the graph editor. If you're familiar with After Effects or, you know, a lot, a lot of packages have this. If you do any type of animation, the graph editor is a very common thing and tool to have in any software. So if you go to Windows, uh, you go down to the anima animation editors and then you choose graph editor. Now we can see green is for translate Y. So we know that's translate Y. We can see this kind of uh, springy uh, thing that we drew in Photoshop. You know, it goes up, then down, then up, then down, right? And that's what it looks like right here. Up, down, up, down. Okay. We can also leave this up. I'm going to drag this off just so we can see the screen. We can also edit from the graph editor, but let's play back what we have and see if we need to make any edits. So everything kind of happens at the same time. What we can do now is to offset the timing of everything because it's all happening at the same time and that's not appealing in animation. If everything happens at the same time, that's a no-no. So let's change that. Let's deselect the first one. We can control, right click and drag and deselect it. You could also control click it in the outliner Let's take all of these keys and drag them down two frames. So you can move frames two different ways. You can move them in the graph editor and you can move them on the timeline. And I prefer the, the graph editor just because it's a little easier to select everything. You just click and drag, whereas down here you have to shift select and then drag everything and it makes it red and it's like, where do I select? And it's just kind of busy down here. And I, it's hard to see, uh, it's just not my preference. We could click here and just start dragging and it'll do the same thing. You can see it in the graph editor, uh, moving it around, but I just like the graph editor. We have all of the keys selected, clicking and dragging. We have only uh, the middle ones minus the second one because that one's you know gonna start the animation. It's gonna kind of do a domino effect from left to right. So let's hit W and then let's hold shift and middle mouse. And then you see, we have this little question mark pop up with an arrow. It's saying, which direction do you want to isolate? So the first movement our mouse makes is the direction it will choose to isolate it. So it's a little sensitive when you first start. So if you middle mouse and then you go to the right, now it's isolated and, right, and left and right, and it will not go up and down. If we wanted to go, you know, change the vertical values, we could, our first movement with the mouse after we shift and middle click could be uh, up and down. And if you mess that up, just, you know, take your hand off a of shift and, you know, take your right finger off of, uh, or take your finger off of middle mouse and uh, just start and try again. If that's uh, too complicated for you, just keep practicing that. Okay, so we want to go to the right by two frames for each one of these spheres. So it'll be an offset of two frames. So we'll one, two, then we'll deselect the next one. Then we'll go, uh, we'll pick our W again to get the move tool, select everything. Shift, middle mouse, drag one, two. Deselect that, select everything, 
and W to get the move tool. One, two, deselect. One, two, I'll do it over here now. One, two, again, that's command or control click over here in the outliner to deselect something. Okay, so now when we select all the spheres and we look and we can see each one is offset and there's a bunch of red marks down now down here in the timeline, that's okay because we know we did that on purpose and we did it after we did the animation, that's kind of key. If you start offsetting things and then try to do this, uh, you're just wasting your time. We I did this intentionally, do all of the springy animation first together and then do the offsets one by one, okay? So let's play back and see what we have. Alt V. That's much more appealing than the first thing that we had. And I'm liking that quite a bit. So that's the end of the lesson for animating. I will see you in the next one. Okay, now that we have the animation done, let's focus on getting this thing finished. Let's create an X and Y axis, a background, and then maybe some titles for each of the months. We'll start by creating the background. We'll go up here and click the square. And if we hit F, we can see, if we hit four, we can see it is inside there. Let's drag that down by hitting W. We get the translate options. And by hitting R, we get the scale options. Let's just scale that up. Actually, one thing we can do to make this a little easier is let's move the pivot point back over here now. We can do that by holding down D. And now we see we have these new options as soon as we start holding down D. Let's hit the X and drag it back here. Now when we scale, it will only go from that direction. If we want to make it exact, we can actually hold D and then V and then do this and it'll snap to vertices. So let's hit R again. And now we can scale this out as far as the length of the line chart. Down around over here is good. And let's drag that down a little bit and let's make it a little wider. Now we can see starting to have a place to live there. Okay, and let's maybe make it a little thicker. Go back into shaded mode by hitting five on the keyboard. Now we can get rid of the grid because we are now kind of making our own floor here. So we can go up here and click this little button to get rid of the grid. So now we can kind of see how our own floor is turning out. And just to give it a little more uh, roundness, because it's so sharp, we can uh, right click and go to edge while our cursor is over the object. And then we can select all of the edges. And let's go up here to the bevel option. We can also get to it from the modeling tool set if we click the far left button up here. And we get a new set of tools. And that same icon is over here for bevel. So when we bevel it, um, it will kind of divide everything down and try to round out these edges. And we get this new option to kind of adjust different things. Let's crank up the settings to round off that edge a little bit. And then we can increase the distance of how far in it bevels with the fraction. I think that's pretty good. We can right click and drag to object mode to get back to object mode. Unclick that and it's a little it's a little nicer instead of that straight edge. Now we can duplicate this, Command D or Control D, and we can rotate that 90 degrees. And to make sure it's exactly 90, we can go over here, go down to rotate Z. It's at 86. So we can just type in 90. Now it's exactly 90. We can do the same thing for our backdrop. And duplicate this, rotate it in the X 90 degrees. And we can move the pivot now to the bottom of this. We can hit D, hold down D and V. 
then we can drag it to the bottom. And then if we hold V without the D, we can, uh, while we have our W uh, manipulator tool option on, it will just move vertex snap that object down. Now we just need to move it back a little bit so we can vertex snap that again to the back. And if we go into component mode, right clicking vertex, we can select the top vertices and just drag them up to create the backdrop. And we can do the same thing for this one that we rotated up, go to vertices and bring them down. I would vertex snap this by holding down V, but then it'll smash and get rid of that nice little bevel we have. So we can just eyeball this since we're not, the camera is not going to be spending a ton of time up there or that won't be very noticeable if it's barely off. So right click and choose object mode to get out of that component mode. And let's see, let's move this over a little bit. Let's actually move all of that. Let's just go over here in that line. It's a little easier. Shifts, click those. Let's drag them over. Maybe drag them down a little bit. Okay, cool. So we have our little shelf. Maybe let's pull these down so they're even. Go to the vertices. So they're even with the bottom here. Okay. All right, great. Now we'll add the 12 months to the axes and add some numbers to the vertical axes, the Y axis in the next lesson. Thanks for watching. Adding text in the newer versions of Maya is pretty straightforward. We actually have this uh, text tool up here. They've introduced it in the last few versions of Maya. And when you click it, it will change the channel box now into the attribute box over here on the right. And we can see that's selected by this button over here is the attribute. We can go back to the channel over here. But to be able to change the text in there, we want to go to the type attribute node. And there's all these tabs up here and they each do something a little different. But for the housing of all the info that we're concerned about, it's under the type node, which is what you would expect uh, by its name. So we can type in Jan for January and we can drag that down. And let's pull up the grid again and we'll actually go to, so I'm holding down space and clicking and dragging and letting go and we'll go to the front menu. So we can kind of see the grid and where it's lined up. Let's center the text and we can see it's lined up with that, with that vertical axis. Problem is it's a little too big because it's gonna run in. We need room for each one of the months over here. So we can reduce the font size quite a bit. Let's make that just an even number so we can remember it. And then we can hit the type tool again. We'll hit seven, we'll say Feb. Maybe we want to put periods here. And then we can hold down X, kind of like we were doing earlier with V, X means the grid. So it'll snap to the grid. And we want to center align that. And let's just see how far down did we pull this so we can pull all of them the same distance down. Negative, let's say 15. So now we know negative 15 every time. And then we'll just do this for every month. And then we can do the same thing for the values up here. We know that we're starting at 55 um, from our original data set. Now that we're putting our grid down, let's actually adjust this to reflect closer to this because I think it would be um, slightly deceiving to have this be uh, at the very bottom. Uh, like it's implying it's zero or something. So I think it's nice uh, when it's in this kind of condensed view to have the first value well above the this X axis. So let's make that edit right now. And I'll show you an easy way to do that. We can select all the spheres because we know that all the spheres control the way that we rigged it. It controls everything, right? So we can go to the graph editor 
and we'll go Windows, Animation Editors, Graph Editor. We can see all the keyframes that we made. And if we click select and drag all of those, and we hit W to pull up the transform tool, we can kind of do what we did earlier when we offsetted these in the X axis and in time, and we can do this vertically in value. So if we look at the graph here, it looks like 60, you know, they're going by kind of increments of 10 or five, sorry, five. So we can kind of do the same thing with our grid that we have here. So let's pull up this sphere to this line and we'll call that 60. That way we'll know, you know, everything else after it is going to be in relation. It will be in the right position. So let's hover over here, uh, hit W and we'll hold down shift middle mouse and then sc start scrolling upwards or not scrolling, but we'll start moving our cursor upwards. Um, and so we'll get that kind of right. I'm looking at that February month. We'll get that right on that grid line. And we can see that the following months should be somewhat in that ballpark. Okay. And I'm just now realizing I've, uh, I think originally I moved the wrong sphere to the wrong data point, but of course this is just a made up example. So I'm not going to worry about that too much. We can go to May and pull that down. I think is the problem. January, February, March, April, May. I think May is too high. So we can go over here and just select the top ones because we don't want to mess with uh, where it's starting. And we can just pull this one down because it looks like it's pretty straight and then it pops up in June. So February, March, April, May, and then June. Now that looks kind of right. Okay. So, you know, you can go in and tweak this stuff on the fly as you're editing it. And it looks like because we moved everything up that uh, both of these edges are maybe too high. So if we want, we could do the vertex and pull that up. So let's drag those up a little bit. Then we can click through this side one and do the same. Hit F to frame up on it. Get it even with the top here. So I also just hit spacebar here, and that's a quick way to jump between the four view option here and the single view. You can enlarge whichever view that you want. So you could do it by the spacebar as we've been doing, or you can just hit spacebar by itself once. It'll pull up the four windows and you can kind of bounce back and forth. Okay, so now we have January, February, and we can do the rest of the months and let's just group these together and try to stay organized. I'm just hitting command G to group things. Great. So I'll continue to make the January and February uh, just to show the numbers as well. It's the same, same process. I'm going into the front view, which you can get with the space bar. And you can see because I switched to the front view, it's now this top right one, which used to be perspective uh, is now front. And so we have two fronts. Um, so we can just, you know, change that top right one back to perspective if we want. And I'm going to go in and hit the text tool again and call this 55 and move this over and I'll hold down X and it looks like we'll be close to maybe that grid point and maybe 10 just to be in the neighborhood of uh, the seven that we know that this text is. And then I'll do the rest of these going up the grid and going down the months. And I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we will add some color to our graph. We have this gray shaded thing now that's hard to see what's going on. So let's take an overview of what we've done so far um, and get caught up. I made all of the numbers as we had done for all the other text 
and in the front view I used the grid to help kind of get them in the right place and by holding X and um, snapping to the grid and I made all the months and put them in their own groups so you should have something similar to this in the outliner that looks like that now that we have the text in groups we can select just the groups and let's bring them to the front now and that looks pretty good and let's start to add color so let's select the background pieces and we'll add a new material we'll do that by holding down right click while our mouse is over one of them and we'll scroll down to where it says assign new material and we'll release the right mouse and there's a lot of materials here but we're going to keep it simple and use an old standby called the blend now we have assigned the shader to all three of those we can hit six and go into a mode where we can begin to see the color changes and we're in the attribute editor right now which is this button under the attribute editor here as well so you can minimize that and bring it back when, when i brought it back you can see we don't have the same window that we had and that's not a big deal we can see that we still have the blend over here in this tab so we can just click that tab we can also rename the shader to be something else background color maybe i've already experimented and picked a color that i like so i'm just going to enter those values in here you can also change to rgb uh, this is hue saturation and value so sometimes maya is a little buggy and depending on the update that you have, the version you might run into things like this that we change the color, but now it's not changing anymore. So let's uh, go out by hitting spacebar. Let's test these other views to see if they're doing the same thing. Yeah, it appears to be a glitch in Maya. So let's run through a couple of things I'm just throwing down a light and running through the different modes okay so it looks like we had to open up the hypershade to get the color to work basically maya can be glitchy that's why i say post questions in discussion or message me if you run into something like this where you get a result you didn't expect or nothing happens when something should happen sometimes it is just a bug and I'm sure maybe they've probably even fixed this by now. This is a pretty obvious one. So I'm sure they fixed this. And I'd rather leave this kind of stuff in the course than edit this out so you can see what actually happens in real life <laughs> when you're using 3D. Yeah, so what I did to fix that was I finally figured out how to work around it. And that was to open up what's called the hypershade. That's just kind of the library of your materials. So to get to the hypershade, you can click this little orb over here and this is next to all the render buttons and if you don't have that it might be collapsed down like one of these little arrows so you can click that and you can open up the hypershade and that seemed to refresh the shaders which makes sense it's the library so that would refresh what we're seeing unfortunately that's uh part of working in 3d is every time they come out with a new version of maya things that used to work now don't work or they're just a little glitchy and then they make updates for them. It's just a constant thing that um, if you use Maya or any 3D package, you'll have to get comfortable with uh, troubleshooting stuff like this and not freak out. It's just part of part of working in 3D. So anyway, we let's get back on track and change the color back to what I had had it. And so if I click on the color here, it will remember the different kinds of colors that I've picked lately. So there's the last one that I did. So I'll pick that. 
And of course it's not working again. So let's try to refresh with the hyper shade again. And that seemed to work again. So I had to close the hyper shade and reopened it. And let's apply a new shader to the tube. So I'll right click and go down to assign new material. And for this one, I'm just gonna choose a Lambert. It is uh, pretty similar to a blend, except it doesn't have reflections. So I'm going to pick the color I had uh, chosen earlier. One thing that I'm not a huge fan of now that I'm seeing this is how thick this cylinder is. We can change that after the fact, even though we've done all these things and we've rigged it to this curve and animated it and all this stuff. Maya keeps a history of everything you do to objects and you can get to those in the channel box over here and click that and scroll down and you kind of have a history of everything that you've done. So we can see we made the poly cylinder, we extruded it, and then the tweak and cluster are um, about the deformer. And then we deleted that edge over here as well. So it keeps a history of everything that we did. So let's just go back to the first one and click on that. And it pops down a menu of things and we can click on radius and middle mouse drag in the viewport. And lo and behold, it changes the radius of the whole thing. And I think we need a little smaller radius now that we've done some work on it. And then I'm gonna click all the spheres. I'm gonna to go to the outliner and shift select them all over here and hover over one of them and right click and hold and go to assign new material again. I'm gonna choose another blend and go to that color and then choose a color I had found earlier that I like. And there we go. One other thing we can do is to add some lights and we can also add some grids to this by duplicating this out and bringing it up and scaling it in. And I'm just eyeballing this um, just for speed sake, but of course you can get very specific with this stuff if you need to be. So I'm gonna scale that in just to have some kind of grid lines here on the numbers that I put in. I'm just hitting Command D to duplicate and dragging those up. And we can do the same for the horizontal. So I'm gonna duplicate that, or actually we could just, uh, yeah, let's, let's duplicate special from just this side one. So I haven't duplicated it yet, it's still just that one. So I'll go to edit, duplicate special. I'm clicking the little square over here to pull up these options. And we have the options from the last time that we worked as well saved in here. So we can actually just do that again, except we're gonna need 12 of them this time. And I can hit duplicate special and we get 12 of them. So the only thing we need to do is to line those up with the grid of the months. So there we go. And then we can scale all of them together to help make the grid a little better size and then push that back against this wall. And that stuff can just go straight through to the back. It's not gonna hurt anything. And then we need to make these a little smaller as well. So we can scale that down and then push it back into the back wall. Kind of even with the, you can see this front edge is even with the vertical ones. So now we have a little grid as well. One of the last things we can do is to light it as well. So we can go to the rendering tab up here and click a directional light. And nothing changed yet because we don't have lights turned on. So we can hit this little light bulb or we can hit seven on our keyboard. And by scaling lights, it doesn't really do anything. It's just for yourself to visualize what's going on. And let's kind of go down with that. And let's turn on shadows as well, which is right next to the light bulb. So it adds a little more dimensionality there. You can adjust the angle of the light. And then let's add an ambient light as well, which is this far left one. And it just lights up everything as you can see, which is, it's a little too much right now. So we can go to maybe 0.2 in intensity. And to get to that, I'm just in the um, attribute 
section here and it's just in this uh, you can just kind of scroll through the tabs and find the one that has you know the color and intensity for the light okay so I don't want to see the lights anymore because I think I'm happy with that so I can just say show and say lights so we can still see the lights that's not the same thing as the light bulb up here that's just seeing the, the manipulators in the screen so I kind of like that okay and let's play that and see what we got so to export this from Maya we are going to make a play blast and a play blast simply exports um, exactly what we see in the viewport right here and we can adjust the dimensions that it will export if we want HD like 1080p um, to kind of test the framing and see where the camera is let's press this little frame button up here and that will give us the framing and it'll also tell us 960 by 540 which is too small so let's go up here to this little gearbox next to the hyper shade that we talked about earlier and those are the render settings it will open up a new window and there's a lot of options here but let's just scroll down to the bottom of this first tab and we can just choose a preset for HD 1080. Cool, and we can see that changed up here, and now we're in 1080. One thing we can do as well is to help sell the effect of this being 3D is to make a little uh, animated camera move. So let's do that in the next lesson. In this lesson, we will animate a camera so that we can export a movie from here with an animated camera. We're currently viewing through the perspective camera. We can see that down here, it says persp. And if we go to panels, we can see we have one perspective and then orthographic, we can see our other views. We wanna create a new camera because we don't want to animate the camera we actually use to navigate around. That wouldn't make a ton of sense and we'd constantly be adding keys and deleting keys uh, just to be able to navigate and see what we're doing. So we wanna, animate on a separate camera. We'll click new and it will automatically put us in that new camera. We can see it's persp one. We can rename that as render cam. So we can make sure we're keeping track of that. And let's kind of get it down here in the neighborhood and turn on the framing so we can make sure we're framing it up correctly. Let's just do something subtle. So let's go to frame one and we will change to the channel boxes up here so we can see the translate rotates. And we're just gonna hit S because we are gonna key everything on this. And let's go all the way, I think to the end maybe. And we'll just do like a subtle camera angle change. And because we have our Sorry, I had that window up there. Uh, because we had our auto key on, it automatically made a keyframe here. So when we start to scrub, that animation is already in there. Let's play back and see. I think that's pretty good. Now we can export this as a movie in a couple different ways. We aren't going to do a super fancy render um, that takes a lot more time and We'll get into the weeds a little bit too much on that. For this first one, I just want to uh, stay with a play blast, which is what Maya calls rendering exactly what we're seeing in the viewport. So if let's turn off the guides now that we have it done correctly. And, and let's also make sure once we have these keys set that we're not all of a sudden moving around and then we've changed our animation. So I'm gonna undo that. One way to do that is you can actually lock the camera if we select all of these attributes and then right click. We can scroll down here and say lock selected. So if I try to navigate now, I can't. And the other thing we can do so we can view things simultaneously is go to layouts, two panes side by side. And I can do that again. That was a little too fast. You go to panels and you can go layout, two panes side by side. I just did it from the hotbox the first time there but this does the same thing. And then we can change this one to perspective. And now we have the purse down here and the render cam on the left side. So we can navigate around here. We could even 
click this to select the camera or we could select it from the outliner and it's locked so we can see that the manipulator tool is grayed out we can't physically we can't move that so if we wanted to move it we can unlock it and animate it some more and pull that around but i think it's okay for our purposes and now we can focus on exporting a movie if we right click in the timeline okay i'm gonna have to raise this software window of maya up just so that we can see the menu um we, we're still in the kind of frame even though we're smashing the viewport that doesn't that won't matter um we can see that we're still you know similar framing if i right click in the timeline anywhere i get a bunch of different options and the option we're interested in to export is called a play blast if i hover over the square and release i get a bunch of options and i will reset the settings so we're all working on the same page and we can export as a and and depending on if you're on a pc or a mac these might look a little different but essentially it's do you want to render in quick time or do you want to render an image sequence and uh, quick time uh, this is just the codec to choose from and instead of window uh, we can choose from render settings because that's what is describing the dimensions the 1920 by 1080 hd if we chose window it would be this squashed version we don't want that we want from render settings and then we want the scale to be one because we don't want the scale down version of hd and we want to save this file and you can browse wherever you want to save it to for this first one i want to show um, an image sequence just in case um, you want to change the background and we want to make sure we're picking a png which will have a transparent background here where we have this gradient because you know in maya the background you know if you're doing a quick time you can just hit alt b and change the color of the background render out or, or sorry play blast out a uh, movie and be done with it but if you want to take it into something like after effects and adjust the background or change it it's a little easier to have an image sequence and have this be transparent around it so that's what we're going to do and i'll run you through um, after effects when we're done so i've chosen image png render settings scale of one and i'm going to save this and make a new folder call it play blast double click that and again make sure it's a png i don't know why that doesn't automatically fill that out and then say line chart and it'll automatically give it the numbers for each frame and the sequence of pngs so this is weird why it would like change we've already chosen png so just double check everything that it's as how you would like it and it will play blast the this timeline and we've been working at 120 frames but if for whatever reason you have animation that's longer or or what have you then you can adjust that by clicking this little area of the timeline and dragging it out you can also just type in whatever number you want here and it'll uh, go to that and limit it to that and that's the area that's the amount of time you'll play blast okay so now we're ready to play blast and i will see you in the next lesson okay now we've exported the play blast we can see where it exported it here and we can switch over to after effects and load in our image sequence we can right click over here and say import file we can go to wherever we had saved it and all, you just need to click one of the images and it should register as a png sequence if it doesn't you can click this checkbox and it will import as a sequence we can see it is in 24 frames a second if it wasn't in 24 frames a second or you changed the frames per second from maya you can right click on the file over here and go to interpret footage, go to main. And in here we can choose uh, what frame rate we want right here, assume this frame rate. But 24 is fine, so we'll just go with that. And we can click and drag this into the new composition button and it'll make a new tab here for the new composition. And we can fit this 
and see that we have a transparent background. So that worked out great. And the only little thing is there are these, um, the axes and the cam that we had chosen. So we can just click the layer, go to the mask box and click and drag it over there. And instead of add, we want subtract. We can do the same thing here as well and say subtract. So now that we have our image here, we can see it kind of just stops abruptly. We can actually extend that out if we would like. Command K. I can pull up the composition settings or you can go to composition, composition settings. Let's extend this by 100 frames. So the duration will be longer. And then I can minus out to see it. And I'm going to duplicate this layer and then can go to time, freeze frame, and it made a little keyframe here. So that frame will be held. So we will have a little camera move and they can hold there. If you're giving a presentation or something or editing this later, it just gives you more options to have a little hold there at the end. So we can make our background now. Let's right click anywhere over here, or you can right click up here and say new solid. We can pick a uh, gray of some kind, maybe. And hit OK. Drag this to the bottom. And I don't like that color, so we can go to the effects controls, right click and say generate fill. And then we can change that color to whatever we want. Turn saturation down all the way. Okay, and then let's do something like that. And then let's make a vignette and choose an adjustment layer, which is just one off of the screen here, right clicking and uh, let me just do it up here. New adjustment layer. And then in the effects controls, we can right click and add there's a bunch of different ways you can do this. Uh, I'm just going to add, uh, let's do th this with curves. I'm going to drop this down and then that's darkened everything, but I just want to darken the border. So I'm going to go to the ellipse tool with this adjustment layer selected and I will double click it and it will make an ellipse, the size of the composition. And I want to go to subtract. Now it's reversed it and I toggle down mask and feather the mask. So I'm just clicking and dragging. And it's made a nice little vignette. I think it makes it look a lot better. So our movie is ready to export from After Effects. We can do that by going to Composition, Add to Render Queue. The shortcut is also on a Mac. Command Shift Dash, and it'll add it to the render queue. We can choose what codec we want to export as. Apple ProRes 422 is a little overkill. We can say H.264, limit data rate to 12,000. We don't have any audio. And then we can specify a location here. We'll say line chart, save and we'll hit render. In the next lesson, I will just do one little finishing touch thing that goes a little deeper into After Effects. So if you're interested in that, follow along to the next lesson. Otherwise, you can just skip that. It's just a little flourish to add a little bit of glow to our render to make it pop a little bit more. Thanks for watching. Okay, I wanted to have one little bonus video that focuses a little more on After Effects and how to punch up something as simple as this play blast to just make it a little bit nicer. And what we're going to do is glow these red balls. And we're going to do that with keying. So we're going to want to key this whole thing. So instead of having to do it twice between this held layer and this one, let's just pre-compose both of these. So we'll go to layer, pre-compose, and then we'll add them into one layer. We'll move all attributes and hit OK. Now we just have one layer to work with, which will be much easier. So let's duplicate that one layer. 
and we want to isolate the red balls. And we can do that through keying. So let's go to the effects controls, right click, and go down to keying and choose key light 1.2 or whichever version you have, key light. And we'll pick the screen color to be this red. So let's go over to this red, select that. And let's isolate this so that we can see that it's actually worked. So we can see through to the other side. So now that we have this isolation, we also don't want this background. So we can actually add, let's add that background into the pre-composition. Let's jump in here by double clicking and we can add this to the bottom. So now, we only have the red balls. So we could have done that earlier, but that's one of those things that I didn't realize, you know, till after the fact, that's probably what we needed to pre-compose as. So we have this isolation. Let's choose a new solid, right click it down here, new solid. And we're gonna make it to be this red color that we chose, hit okay. And we'll drag it below this layer that we keyed. So now it looks pretty similar to what we have before. Let's, let's just see what the difference is. It's pretty similar, you can't really tell the difference. So what we wanna do is use this red and add it on top of this other red. By using an add blend mode, it'll make it look a little brighter, like it's almost like a light source. So I don't know if you noticed that change. Let me zoom in so we can see that a little better. So this is normal and this is add. And to make it glow, we need to blur this out a little bit. And if we were to blur the red, that wouldn't really do much because it's just a solid color. So what we need to do is blur what it is matted by to blur these edges. So let's go up here to the line chart and go under the king, right click and choose blur, fast blur. Let's repeat edge pixels and we'll just Unsolo this so we can see what we're doing. And we'll drag up this blurriness. And let's turn off the visibility so we can't see the actual layer. And make sure that we are doing an alpha inverted mat. So now what we've got is this red solid being matted by this blurred out layer and it's blurring this edge that we keyed out around these red orbs. So it kind of fakes this glow effect. Um, if we turn that on and off, you can kind of see it does add quite a bit. You know, it just adds a little life to this. And we could go through and do a similar thing to the lines, but I think for this purpose, I think the red orbs are just a nice little pop, a little ping to this graph. So, I'm liking where that's at, and I think that's ready to render again. And of course, we could do this more than once. We could duplicate this and make it even brighter. That's a little too much, but I think it does help a little bit. So we can click here on the red layer and hit T to pull up opacity, and we can just dial that back a little bit just to add a little extra glow than what we had before. So I think that's good. Let's render it. Command shift dash or question mark and choose the correct codec that we would like. I'm going to go LT this time and hit OK. Turn off the audio and save it as glow. All right, that is how you make a line chart in Maya and After Effects. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next class where we will discuss more data visualization in Maya. All right, congratulations for making it all the way to the end of the course. That's a huge accomplishment and hopefully you learned something. Leave a comment below and let me know what kind of eureka moments you had or maybe you thought Maya wasn't as intimidating as you originally thought and uh, you're excited to learn more about Maya. And if that's the case, I have a ton of Maya classes at digitalcreatorschool.com and you can learn everything from A to Z there, basically. You can learn to create your own character, to rig it, to animate it, 
You could learn to use motion capture. You could learn to make motion graphics. You could learn to make 3D medical animation. Maya is really an awesome sandbox to learn how to play in. So if you want to learn more about that, you can get a monthly subscription at digitalcreatorschool.com or you could get a bit of a discount if you get the annual subscription because you do get access to every new course that I put out, which is about once a month, once every other month, depending on the size of the course that I'm making. But I'm constantly updating the site with new courses. So if you remember, you get access to all that stuff and you get to download all the project files. So that's it for this course. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Please leave a comment below and let me know what you thought and uh, like and subscribe goes a long way. So thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.